Dr. Brett O'Bannon is the Director of Conflict Studies at DePaul University. He's going to come tonight and talk to us about not only the issue, the horrendous issue of genocide uh, and what is done in response and reaction to that, but how that can be prevented and what policymakers today in general and the UN in particular uh, are discussing and planning in terms of prevention for genocide. So please help me welcome to our podium tonight, Dr. Brett O'Bannon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, let me get my tech stuff uh, out of the way. I really need this reminder of time, because uh, I really want to get us to the Q&A. That's always my favorite part. So, um, good. All right, so thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks to the, to the council for the invitation. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. I'm, and tomorrow, I'm certain, will we'll also be. It's just been an honor, and, and I'm grateful that you came out tonight. <clears throat> And uh, to hear, uh, I think, uh, a talk that's, that matters. I, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about mass atrocity. And uh, I kind of jokingly say, as a result of how much I think about mass atrocity, I'm really great at parties now. Uh, so don't forget to invite me. And it's actually true. I think I told the story today. I, um, went to go pick up my daughter from her dance uh, uh, class after having finished watching some very difficult testimony from the Sierra Leonean uh, war, crime, um, um, uh, war tribunal in which a woman, I won't go into the details, but really, really discussed things that a mother should never have to see. And then the class ended and we had no time to process and I went to go pick up my daughter and I walked in and three or four of my friends were sitting at a table picking up their daughter, and so it was about five minutes before the kids were finished, so I sat down at the table. And in two to three minutes, I realized that that table had transformed from a jocular, joking, you know, to just, I had just shut them down, because I just came in and dumped this horrendous story on them. And so, um, so I <laughs> kind of mean it, I'm really great at parties now, so. Uh, it's been a while, I think, since I've been in, uh, invited to a party. Um, that is all to say that um, so I should give you something of a trigger warning. I'm going to talk uh, at various points tonight uh, about some difficult issues. And, uh, and there are two images up here. So if there are, I don't think there are any children, but they're, they're, and they're not, they're not real challenging. But there's a picture of Muammar Gaddafi after he's been captured in the Syrian intervention and uh, Ilan Kurdi, the young Syrian boy. So just a, just a, just a warning. So I'm, I'm grateful you're here. Um, I should also say a word about the term genocide. Um, in reality, I'm, I, I, I think it's fair to say that my talk is really about mass atrocity prevention, or as we'll say, kind of four crimes associated with this notion known as the responsibility to protect. War crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. Uh, never again, question mark. As we'll see, we've been making this promise to um, take serious the uh, notion that no one should die in a, in a mass atrocity crime. We said never again after the Holocaust, and we have watched genocide happen again and again and again and again. And it is happening at present in at least three sites. So we've struggled to keep this promise that we made in 1948 in the Genocide Convention. Uh, and reaffirmed in 2005 as an international community at the UN World Summit when it adopted language known as the responsibility to protect. Uh, so I want to tell a little history here. Um, the Cold War was cold only between the superpowers. It was a really hot environment everywhere else. Right? But during the Cold War, the notion of sovereignty, state sovereignty, this idea that countries in the world have a right to be free from intervention by outside actors, that's a, kind of the central element of sovereignty. It reigned supreme throughout the Cold War period. What that meant was that non-interventionism was this bedrock principle of international relations. Um, and as a result, you would think that it would be a kind of a, um, a, a, a more pleasant, a more peaceful environment. But 
it couldn't have been further from the truth. This bedrock principle of international affairs never, um, was co coterminous with a really violent period. Right? The reason sovereignty prevailed was that there was this existential fear of any intervention, of any conflict, escalating to the level of an exchange between the nuclear superpowers. Existentially unacceptable. Right? Nevertheless, during the period of the Cold War, my guess is, my estimate is about 100 million people perish at the hands of their own governments, either intentionally or through negligence or bad policy. 100 million. Uh, a total of 350 million perish at the hands of their own government throughout the whole of the 21st century, of the 20th century. You would think 100 million people would lead us to a great deal of interventionism, but that's just not the case. I mean, during the whole of the Cold War, there were but three humanitarian interventions. Right? The first one in 1971, when India invaded East Pakistan to bring an end to the slaughter of over a million East Pakistanis. In 1978, Vietnam invaded Cambodia to bring an end to the killing fields of the Pol Pot regime. And in the same year, and lasting into 1979, Tanzania invaded Uganda to bring an end to Idi Amin's despotic regime. It was responsible for upwards of 500,000 dead. Throughout the whole of the Cold War period, there were but 18 UN-authorized peacekeeping missions. 18. Some of them were unarmed, right? so these were classical peacekeeping missions. This was just sending in invited soldiers to stand between formerly warring parties to help them implement a peace plan that they themselves had, had signed off on. Right? That's the kind of classic conception of peacekeeping. Things start to change at the end of the Cold War. Right? Something I suggest of a perfect storm comes together. It starts with the disillusion of the Soviet Union. We lose our fear of that ever-present nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. <coughs> Russia replaces the Soviet Union on the Security Council, and all of a sudden we have a much more amicable Security Council. And the reason that's important is that if we're going to intervene militarily to bring an end or to prevent a mass atrocity crime, like genocide or ethnic cleansing, the Security Council has to authorize it, otherwise it's unlawful. So a more cooperative Security Council meant more operations. As a result, we got a great deal more interventions, as we'll see. At the same time, the very nature of organized armed violence itself is changing. At the beginning of the 20th century, there's a kind of um, a duality of intrastate civil war and interstate war. By the end of the 20th century, interstate war has just essentially disappeared. Our invasion of Iraq was truly anachronistic in many, many ways. Most of the organized armed violence out there today is civil war, intrastate war. And another way that war has changed. At the outset of the 20th century, eight soldiers died for every civilian. By the end of, that 20th, by the end of the 20th century, that ratio had completely reversed. Eight civilians were dying for every armed combatant. So take these things together, a spike in civil conflict, a change in the nature of civil conflict, the dissolution of the Soviet Union in a more amicable, more cooperative Security Council, and we have a recipe for expanded interventionism. And that's what we get. And George Herbert Walker Bush termed this era the New World Order, which is really kind of ironic. I talked about this morning in that really interesting class at, in, um, in Roger's class at uh, on campus this morning. Um, it's ironic that George Herbert Walker Bush led the intervention into Somalia, because nearly 20 years to the day prior, when India invaded East Pakistan on a humanitarian intervention to end that genocide, it was the United States that led the international outcry against India's actions. And it was then US ambassador to the United Nations, George Herbert Walker Bush, who became the voice of that message. 20 years later, he will decide that it is appropriate, and I certainly agreed, to lead an international military force into Somalia to save two to 400,000 people from starving to death. It truly was a new world order, and he embodied it quite personally. 
we get this changing nature of what even constitutes the, the reason for action in, in, in international affairs. The Security Council, the UN, is allowed to authorize, according to its charter, the use of force in international affairs for threats or threatened breaches of international peace and security. International peace and security, that sounds like one country attacking another. We start to change our understanding of what that language means. And George Bush led the intervention into Somalia in the name of international peace and security, even though the causus belli, if you will, because as Roger reminded us this morning, anytime you engage in a humanitarian intervention, a military humanitarian intervention, you are waging war. But we did so in the name of famine, but we still called it an international peace and security threat. As a result of all this, we get this massive expansion in peace operations. In the first five years after the Cold War, there are more peace operations authorized than in the whole of the Cold War, 20. And, and by today, there have been 51 post-Cold War peace operations, more than twice the number of the whole of the Cold War. And they are much more complex, and they are often much, much more aggressive. Um, now, um, the, um, the 90s were a really difficult era for us. We got involved, or, or we had plenty of opportunities to involve ourselves in, in atrocity prevention and reaction, but we didn't take every one. The decade opened with, with savage civil wars in West Africa, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, and we really let them just play out and intervened at the very end. But we did involve ourselves in the Somalia debacle. Or which, what became a debacle. And the reason it became a debacle is because of our actions in Somalia. We all kind of know about Black Hawk Down. We know that things went badly, and Americans were often sort of un, un, unsure as to why they hated us because we had just gone there. Well, one of the reasons they turned on us is that we went hunting Mohammed, warlord Mohammed Aidid in Mogadishu with this Spectre gunship in an urban environment. As you can see, the Spectre gunship is not an urban environment hunting piece of equipment, right? So we killed many innocent civilians, and as a result of that, they turned on us and led to the Black Hawk Down. So we've, what I'm getting at here is that the 90s will witness a kind of schizophrenic response to atrocity and atrocity prevention. The apex of the decade, of course, is our inaction in Rwanda, the failure to protect the 8,000 Muslim men and uh, boys of Srebrenica in 1995. But by the end of the decade, we are now going to re-engage. We engage after a 10-year delay in uh, Kosovo to end ethnic cleansing there. And then at the very, but we do so, I should say, in a kind of curious way. The humanitarian motive reigns supreme. I really believe that. But nevertheless, the Clinton administration required that bomber pilots fly at 15,000 feet in order to stay safe above Serbian anti-aircraft weaponry. Flying at 15,000 feet guarantees that your bombs being sent for humanitarian purposes, hence the name humanitarian bombing that we coined during this conflict, will kill some of the very people you were there to save. And the decade ends with an intervention in East Timor and quite a successful one. So the point here is that the 90s are just chaotic. We are all over the place. We don't intervene here, we do intervene there. When we do intervene there, we do it kind of strangely and in, 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 in counterproductive ways, and that means that we didn't really understand the way the world was ordered anymore. We were suffering from a condition known as ontological insecurity. We just couldn't figure out what was expected of us, what's the right thing to do, how should we operate, of what is the world composed, what are the rules that, that regulate our behavior. Kofi Annan, Secretary General, said in 1999, if this business of humanitarian intervention is unacceptable, then how are we going to respond to Rwanda's and Srebrenica's of tomorrow? Because you can guarantee that there is another Rwanda coming there was another act of genocide like Srebrenica in the offing guaranteed. If we can't intervene because of sovereignty, how are we going to respond to these violations of human rights that affect every precept of our common humanity? The response to Kofi Annan came in the form of the, the responsibility to protect. The International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty issued a report in 2001 that wasn't just successful, it's been described as by Thomas Weiss, who you've read in your great uh, decisions 
material, right? as the most successful idea in the normative arena since the genocide convention. Right? What does it say? Well, there were three pillars. There were kind of three elements to the, to the responsibility to protect. The first one was a responsibility to prevent. The idea was the most important element in the UN, the international community's efforts at atrocity response is to prevent them in the first place. The second pillar was a responsibility to react, to respond, as it said, to situations of compelling human need with appropriate measures. The third was a responsibility to rebuild. After a military intervention, we have to stick around and make sure that we address the very causes that gave rise to the conflict, which gave rise to crimes associated with the responsibility to protect, and thus led to the intervention. So rebuilding. So prevent, react, and rebuild. This was the idea. They also gave, I'm going to skip through this uh, quite quickly, they also gave us good just war thinking. I thought it was important at Aquinas to kind of talk about the just war tradition that's fu that finds its way into the ICUS report. But you can see here that they had a, a very clear set of ideas or criteria by which we would make our intervention decisions. We had to have a just cause. It had to be serious. This wasn't just about any old human rights violation. This is about large scale human suffering. Right intention, the humanitarian, the humanitarian impulse has to be supreme, it has to be the last resort, it has to be proportional, all that stuff. And lastly, and this is important for Syria, there have to be reasonable prospects of success. It is unethical, they argue, to send soldiers on a military mission that is unwinnable. Not unreasonable, actually. And my view is that much of the inaction in Syria today results from this reasonable prospects problem. Right? Many, I think correctly, view that there is not much of a military solution to the crisis in Syria. Four years later, the United Nations adopts the language of the responsibility to protect in its World Summit Outcome Document right? and makes it this kind of proto-international law. Right? There are now three new pillars. We narrow the scope of R2P quite dramatically to just four crimes. Right? And we state in the first pillar that states have the primary responsibility for the protection of their populations from these four crimes, genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. The second pillar is that the international community has a responsibility to help states carry out those protection responsibilities. That may include things like development assistance to build structures of, interna uh, of, of, of rule of law to help prevent those kinds of things from, from escalating. And then lastly, when states manifestly fail to protect their populations, to carry out their sovereign responsibilities, that responsibility transfers to the international community. The international community um, takes a pledge, makes a pledge to respond in a timely and a decisive manner to protect populations threatened by those four crimes. We thought the Iraq war was going to smother R2P, a war defended in the name of humanitarian action that wasn't really about a humanitarian motive. Right? But then 2011 changed everything. Two cases suggested that R2P had come of age. In March of, of 2011, well, the Arab Spring came, uh, the, the, the Arab Spring came to the Middle East. Uh, we saw you know, these marvelous demonstrations that brought down Ben Ali in Tunisia and Mubarak in Egypt. But when it came to Libya, those peaceful demonstrations were met by Muammar Gaddafi with violent force, which transformed those peaceful demonstrations into violent opposition and then formal rebel movements, to which Gaddafi responded with even more violence. And then he threatened to respond as if they were cockroaches. He promised to destroy those cockroaches and rats in Benghazi. Cockroaches is not the term to use in a post-Rwandan world. Because that's the language of the Interahamwe, that's the way Tutsis were described when they were told they were being killed for a reason. They were cockroaches. So when Gaddafi promised threatened, and moved his forces to encircle Benghazi, to wipe out the people of Benghazi, people took him seriously. And the Security Council acted with dispatch and passed Resolution 1973, Security Council Resolution 1973, which was the first time the Security Council of the United Nations has ever authorized a military intervention against the express will of a sovereign state. And it did so in explicit language of the responsibility to protect. Reiterating the responsibility of the Libyan authorities to protect the Libyan population. I mean, it is R2P language perfectly. It stated that it would take 
it would authorize all necessary means to protect civilians in the Libyan Arab Jamanhiriya. That's humanitarian intervention, the first authorized against the express will of a sovereign power. And it led to this very complicated and controversial intervention. Two weeks later, the Security Council resolution faces a similar crisis in the Ivory Coast in West Africa, and it passes Resolution 1975, reaffirming the primary responsibility of each state to protect civilians and reiterating that parties to the armed conflict have primary responsibility, yada, yada, yada. R2P again leads the Security Council to authorize military intervention in a sovereign state against its express will for the purpose of human protection. R2P, it seemed, had come of age. It had demonstrated a capacity to mobilize people, to, to move resources, to get the Security Council to act with the kind of dispatch necessary to prevent mass atrocity. R2P was a real deal. And then things went south in Libya. You probably know that Libya is a disaster today. The NATO forces that carried out the humanitarian intervention in, in Libya went way beyond the mandate of UN Security Council Resolution 1973. They engaged quite directly in regime change. Now, to defend them, they came to the conclusion that the only way to defend the civilians of Libya was to remove Muammar Gaddafi, that, for, that as long as he was in power, their survival was in doubt. So they came to that conclusion, but nevertheless, it was a clear violation of Security Council mandate in 1973. As a result of the removal of Saddam, of, of, of Saddam Hussein, oops, <laughs> that's what we call a Freudian slip. <laughs> Um, as, a removal, as a result of the removal of Muammar Gaddafi, a political vacuum emerged and the state collapsed, and it collapsed in such a way. Terrible things happen when states collapse. And into that vacuum has moved jihadist forces, including the worst one, ISIS or Daesh. What is the meaning of Libya? Thomas Weiss, again, who you've read, right, has this to say. The outcome was a triumph for R2P showed the possibility of the international community working through authenticated UN-centered structures, right? A success. He also says, NATO ignored restrictions against targeting Gaddafi, spurned hints of any willingness, and this is clear, I mean, Gaddafi started to make some overtures. They just ignored it and continued the, continued the mission. Broke the UN arms embargo by supplying the rebels, and then they did other things. They, they kind of scuttled an African Union peace mission that had some real prospects or reasonable prospects of success. Uh, as a result of all of this, right, um, yesterday's New York Times has the headline, U.S. increasingly worried about the presence of ISIS in Libya. So we have much to answer for. The second case, R2P, was more clearly viewed by most people as a success. But I was hired in 2012 by the United Nations to do a conflict analysis to advise the UN on how to organize their peace-building community to better integrate, say, groups like UNICEF in with the overall UN country team. Right? So what do I conclude about the meaning of Cote d'Ivoire for R2P and atrocity prevention? Well, it's complicated, right? but I focused on something we seem to have lost in the R2P that was adopted by the World Summit in 2005. Right? And that was that third pillar, that promise to rebuild, that promise of the need to stick around and address the causes of the conflict that, that, that caused the conflict in the first place that gave rise to crimes associated with the R2P. The first thing I concluded, I was there to study officially the post-conflict environment, and my first conclusion was that it wasn't a post-conflict environment. Right? That though the bullets had officially stopped flying in the capital, at least bullets out of AK-47s and M16s, right, there was a great deal of violence in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, including sexual violence of the sort that one witnessed during the war proper. It was a 10-year on-again, off-again civil conflict, terrible civil conflict. Now, Resolution 1975 had authorized all necessary means to protect civilians. 
That ought to include including after the war comes to a conclusion. The responsibility to rebuild, the ICUS report said, was to provide after intervention full assistance and recovery, reconstruction, reconciliation, causes of the harm the intervention was designed to halt or avert. And so it was with, through this lens that I approached my work in, in Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire. It has been said of the president who was seated after the intervention was, was, um, was complete that um, President Watcher has erased all traces of war in Cote d'Ivoire. And the person who said that was the rebel leader that put him into power, well, along with the United Nations. Right? They did things like, or he did things like a truth, reconciliation, and dialogue commission. Right? Uh, he's been very, a World Bank economist, he's been very successful at attracting direct foreign investment. They've enjoyed extraordinary high levels of economic growth since the end of the conflict. I mean, we're talking China levels of economic growth. Right? Um, kind of typical UN-sponsored programs, post-conflict programs like disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, including of child soldiers, kind of standard stuff. Right? Um, and a relatively peaceful election last year that returned the winning team in that war to the presidency through, again, a relatively peaceful election, right? with some 84% of the vote, which is you know, just staggering. And it wasn't kind of traditional you know, 84% of the vote like the old days, right? It was kind of a legitimate 84% of the vote, right? So there's on one level a kind of celebration of Cote d'Ivoire as, as being you know, that which R2P can deliver. Right? But there's another side to, uh, to Cote d'Ivoire that I witnessed, right? Um, I, um, this, is a, this is a map that, that um, uh, captures security events, violent crimes, break-ins, these kinds of things, home incursions by former soldiers and rebel, rebel figures. And you can see that in the southern part of the country, and particularly in the western part of the country, there's a great deal of violence. And, and traveling through that western region was, for the first time in my life, I'll confess, truly existentially frightening. Is the first, and I was in the army, I jumped out of planes for the army, but I was never truly quite as afraid for my life as I was traveling in the west of Cote d'Ivoire. Truly a kind of no man's land now. The state seems to have disappeared out there. Right? Um, and people talk about what's happening to Ivoirian society as a result of this conflict that we're not adequately rebuilding from. Someone said this, someone born in these conditions, this 10 years of on again, off again warfare, right? in 10 or 20 years will dream only of violence. This is, this is suggesting that at the psychosocial level, right, people have been monstrously transformed by their experience with conflict. Right? This, is the, um, this is a refugee camp in Nabili in the West. Right? The day after I visited the refugee camp, 20,000 people were expelled and sent streaming across the border into Liberia, uh, being chased by rebels that had re-emerged in this, quote, post-conflict environment. Right? And a quote here, as for young people, their status is their Kalashnikov, their AK-47 and they are not going to give it up, they say. So they had a DDR program to get rid of these weapons, but today there are three and a half million AK-47s floating around the country. The global price for an AK-47 is about eight to $900. You can buy an AK-47 in Cote d'Ivoire in the capital for about 25 bucks. It is the militarization of society is what I'm suggesting. And then there's the problem of sexual violence, right? It became so normalized during the conflict that it wasn't even viewed as violence at all. And I heard this kind of story over and over and over again. And the women, every woman in this picture, save for the aid worker, is a victim of wartime or post-conflict sexual violence. Every single one, every adult. This description came again and again and again. A soldier would come up to the house in the middle of the night, knock on the door, tell the father to send out his daughter to be raped so that the soldier could engage in his just desserts, his soldier's rest, his roupa de guerrier. And they no longer viewed it as violence. It was just a fact of post-conflict life. We often hear people say, a child no longer emulating Didier Drogba, the, the great uh, uh, soccer player. They're no longer emulating soccer players and, 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 and pop stars. They're emulating the warlords who got rich during this war. 
What this all means is the militarization of Ivorian society. And so what the international community, what the UN, what my critique has been, and I'm, I'm, they've done some things very well, right? They've focused on economic growth rates, direct foreign investment, these kind of, kind, of, kind of obvious measures of success. And they've failed to appreciate that what is emerging in post-conflict Ivoirian society is an intractable conflict. The bullets are no longer flying, but it's coming again. Right? Because there is this real palpable sense of anger and, and, and a justifiable anger given the victor's justice. Both sides in the war committed atrocities. Only one side sits before The Hague today facing war crimes, war crimes charges. As a result of Libya and the complications of Cote d'Ivoire, Syria resides in a shadow. And David Chandler, a well-known scholar of these things, said R2P is dead. Long live R2P. Thank you, David. What does he mean by that? Well, what are the crimes associated with the R2P? What leads us to intervene? What is the call? My screen went blank. I have to find out how much time I have. What is the call? On, to, on what level? At what level are we called to act in the modern era? What does R2P expect of us? The crimes associated with the R2P right, are, in fact, just that. They are crimes. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, setting up the International Criminal Court, which is there to try violators of international humanitarian law, the laws governing the conduct of war. During this century, millions of children, women, and men have been victims of unimaginable atrocities that deeply shock the conscience of humanity. What does it take to shock the conscience of humanity? What does it take to get us to act in the post-Libyan environment. It takes this little boy. Ilan Kurdi washed up on the shores of the Turkish beach, having been rejected by Canada, the home, the originator of the responsibility to protect. The ICUS Commission was Canadian. Having been rejected for asylum, they hit the high seas and perished. And this did seem to shock the conscience of humankind. We started talking about the Syrian crisis and the refugee crisis coming out of that conflict in a more serious way than we had to date. It's led to a dramatic transformation, a dramatic conversation, not everyone's on board, in Europe and even in the United States. It's led to an upping, opening, slight opening of the doors in the United States. Some want to see more. Right? The death of young Ilan Kurdi was preventable. So we failed in our responsibility to prevent. We have weakly reacted, and we are far, far, far from thinking about rebuilding. Syria today, since March of 2011, two million people have been wounded in, in battle, as a and, and many of them civilians. Right? More than 250,000 have been killed. And there's an asterisk here because there is always a debate about, about death tolls. Counting the dead is very complicated business. And recent assessments double that figure, almost double it, 470,000. So we may be talking about half a million dead already. Half of those being civilians. 7,000 people since this conflict started have been tortured to death in Assad's detention centers. More than 11 million people have been displaced from their homes. That's 50% of the Syrian population. That's half the population. At the height of World War II, with all of its massive displacements, that percentage never got past 5%. Half the Syrian population is displaced. There are 4.7, almost 5 million refugees living now outside the Syrian, the Syrian state, and there are nearly 7 million internally displaced persons. As awful as it is to be a refugee living on the edge of subsistence, to be an internally displaced person, to be still stuck in Syria, but not in your home, is hellish indeed. These are truly what Francis Dang said, 
or the world's forsaken. All four R2P crimes have been clearly committed in Syria. War crimes and crimes against humanity take place on a daily basis by Assad, by ISIS, by rebel factions. I mean, ethnic cleansing has been, been perpetrated by all sides in this conflict, including si forces with which we are allied, the Kurds. And acts of genocide, and indeed wholesale genocide, has been uh, prosecuted in this conflict. So where does this leave us? We had 2011. We had this moment at which R2P came of age. We were taking seriously the dictum, the promise of never again. But there is now no observable, in my view, there is no observable dynamic in the Syrian conflict that I can see that suggests an end to the fighting is going to take place in anything like the immediate or medium-term future. There is nothing observable in the conflict, internal to the conflict. There are some external intervention ideas. We're talking about a ceasefire that may take shape this weekend. No one really, no serious observer of this conflict expects that ceasefire to hold. And in fact, many suspect it will be used by the Assad regime in an effort to crush the opposition, the rebellion. So this conflict is far, far, far from, it is approaching what we call a mutually hurting stalemate where there is no military solution, but they can't get out of it. They are stuck. That means, in my view, the death toll is quite likely to reach well past a million before this thing is over. Well more than Rwanda. And displacement, in my view, is likely to grow from its present 50%. This is hardly a stretch. At three and a half million people, or 3.6 million people a year, to well past 75 or 80 percent in the next two to three years. I mean, just you know, diminishing returns. I mean, fewer and fewer people can be displaced because there are fewer and fewer left. But it's totally reasonable to suggest or to predict that upwards of 80 percent of the Syrian population will no longer be in their homes. The Syrian people are indeed being slaughtered, and we are again not living up to our promise of never again. Why is that? Right? Indeed, one of the most important explanations for the failure to act in Rwanda was the failure of our intervention in Somalia. The way it went so badly, so south, so seriously, meant that when Rwanda happened, no one had any taste for intervention, not in Washington, not in Paris, not in Brussels, not at the United Nations. After Libya and the debacle that we helped create, and I was one arguing for an intervention, after the debacle we helped create, no one has the taste for an intervention into Syria, a conflict far more complex than anything we intervened into in Libya. It is an unwinnable proposition in many, many ways. So Ilan Kurdi died, like Rwandans before him, in the shadow of a prior failed promise. So where are we? We have improved. We have demonstrated under certain conditions a capacity to act and act with dispatch. But that is not an uncomplicated proposition. As we talked about this morning in class, to act with dispatch is required to prevent mass atrocity. What we learned from Rwanda was just how damn fast they can kill people. 800,000 people lost their lives in the span of a semester. So if you're going to save lives, if you're going to save strangers, you've got to do it quickly. The problem this raises is that that acting with dispatch may lead you to pull the trigger prematurely. It may lead you to conclude that, in fact, there is a threat of genocide, when in the case of Libya, there may not have been. And as we've seen with the case of Libya, the risks of intervention should never, ever be downplayed. We are waging war when we do so, even in the name of humanitarianism. So I think that the prospects 
of responding more effectively to the next Srebrenica, the next Rwanda, are better than before the responsibility to protect doctrine was born. I think we have proof of that. But if Syria tells us anything, we remain far, far, far from committed to the never again promise. Thank you. So, I think we're gonna have some questions. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Dr. O'Bannon. And what we'll do, like we've done in previous weeks, is we'll send a, um, well, there it is, a uh, number that you can text if you're shy. Mm. Um, but also, please come down to the microphones, microphones if you have a question. Um, and we'll take it from there. But I'd like to start. Um, mm. you, you ended the discussion with Syria. Um, and had talked a little bit about how we uh, are leery to become embroiled in conflict um, because of a fear of um, reasonable prospects of mm -hmm. success. Uh, and you mentioned some of the reasons why there is maybe a fear that that would not take place in Syria. Can you expand on that a little sure. bit more? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, Syria is not a single conflict. It is multiple, uh, all conflicts, all wars are in fact multiple, you know, deeply embedded sets of conflicts. And that's certainly true in, in Syria. But, but at the, the kind of the broadest level, there are at least two quite obvious conflicts, two quite obvious wars, in fact. There's a, a system of two wars that are now interacting with each other in ways that continue to inflame each. There is the Arab Spring become civil war conflict. This is the, for, the, the array of opposition forces fighting to oust the regime of, of, of Assad, the Assad regime right, and his Alawite sect. One of the reasons that Assad has responded with such violent force, such, you know, the use of barrel bombs. I mean, as bad as ISIS is, the Islamic State is a nasty actor. No one would question that. The reality is that the civilian death toll by far is a function of Assad's use of barrel bombs and other weapons against, against unarmed civilians. It's not ISIS that's responsible for most of the innocent civilians dying. Right? The reason he's so assiduous in his effort to respond to the opposition as he has done is because he fears that should they lose, that very tiny Alawite sect that governs Syria will be wiped out in a reprisal for their crimes against the Syrian people of the last 50 years. That's not an unreasonable fear. We've seen that happen before. One of the best books on the Rwandan genocide is called When Victims Become Killers. So, um, so there is a deadlock. There is a kind of um, a commitment on the part of all sides in the, in the conflict um, to continue to wage this conflict for those kinds of reasons. He can't see any settlement that doesn't end in the wholesale destruction of the Alawite people, and the opposition forces are now so bent on the destruction of the Assad regime and its, and its supporters that they see nothing short of complete victory as acceptable. So that's leading us to this mutually hurting stalemate that we call it in conflict studies that is emerging and will continue to pour out tens of thousands of dead on a yearly basis. Um, in addition to that conflict, you have the whole conflict waged by ISIS in the region, in Iraq, in Syria, right? and now a growing combat against ISIS by Western forces, by the French, by the United States, by Britain, uh, Canada. Um, and those two conflicts, as I said, are kind of creating feedback loops into each other, right? which only inflame them and make them harder to resolve. So there's no workable, sorry about that. I have this rule in my class that if you forget to turn your phone on, I get to answer it. That worked pretty well until I just continued to forget my own phone. And so I kept handing it out. And when my mother called and talked to a student, that was the end of that rule. So, um, um, so yeah, so I, I don't know if I've, I've answered your question. There are, um, it's really just about complex systems of conflict that are, are seemingly impenetrable. 
in any meaningful way. It's not going to go well. Please. Thank you for your very wonderful presentation. We've learned quite a lot. Now, my question is related to the composition of the Security Council. Mm. Quite a number of people have the feeling that the composition of the Security Council that gets to vote on when to intervene or not has outlived its usefulness. The I geopolitical agree. landscape that, that was there when they, it, it was constituted has changed. Especially many in Africa feel that if they had representation on the permanent uh, Security Council, then perhaps we would have been seeing more definitive intervention in the chaos that have befallen Africa. What's your comment to that kind of sentiment? Thank you. Um, that's really important. It was something I, I, I meant to address earlier in my talk, and it just didn't end up in the, in the presentation. Um, the composition of the Security Council is deeply problematic. Uh, it is anachronistic. The, the idea that these permanent five members, these five winners of World War II, should forever in perpetuity have veto powers over what the Security Council does is just crazy. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. Right? Uh, so, as you know, um, emerging powers like Brazil, the BRICS countries, South Africa, um, argue that they should be represented as permanent members on the security. So the, idea of, the whole idea of Security Council reform is, is essential to atrocity prevention. Um, South Africa um, was particularly annoyed at NATO powers scuttling of its efforts to find a face-saving move for Gaddafi to leave. And, and I think there was a real prospect of that. Um, uh, but we scuttled it. We just continued to, to, to pursue the intervention. And that's led South Africa to change its position on R2P in a very important respect. South Africa's been one of the most important voices in, in, in support of R2P, but not since, not since the Libya intervention and the, the abuse of the mandate by, by NATO. So, um, so I'm just uh, completely in your camp on this, that, that um, the only way to really move us forward in a meaningful way to get, because this last slide I had up here about the case-by-case -case basis, um, was you know, language of the World Summit Outcome document, that we will not have these trigger criteria that will automatically force an intervention. We're still going to, on a case-by-case -case basis, assess the merits of a possible intervention. Well, that assessment ought to represent a broader swath of the, of the, of the world's society of states. Absolutely. Does that? Yeah, great. Thank you for that question. I, I really wanted to talk about the Security Council and reform earlier. Please. Hi, I guess I'm um, kind of going off of that. Um, What's your name? Lexi. Lexi. Nice to meet you. Um, in class this morning, you mentioned that, um, you know, Russia or China probably won't put any pressure on Assad um, right. at all in the Security Council, especially. So how do you even begin to see a solution in somewhere like Syria um, without, with, with Assad still there and, um, yeah. the, you know, the UN not really having that pressure on them? Um, yeah. I guess what, what can the Security Council or uh, member states do to really, um, I guess, pressure that, or I guess, what, what institutionally That's can great. be done? That's a really great question. It, it allows me an opportunity to, to um, say something that I, I wish I'd said earlier. Um, one of the things about the, I, I guess I mentioned it, but I didn't make enough of it. One of the things about the COSO intervention in 1999 was that we intervened without Security Council authorization, which made it unlawful. We talked about this this morning, I think. Yeah. Um, that's not insignificant. I know a lot in this country sort of prepared to ignore international law because we find it silly and all that kind of stuff. But um, it's serious, right? There are two conditions in international law for the use of force. Self-defense, including preemptive self-defense, and authorization by the UN Security Council under Chapter 7 of the UN, of the UN Charter. Um, we didn't have that in Kosovo. But people, were people like me were clamoring for an intervention to go save Kosovar Albanians from the ethnic cleansing being perpetrated by the Serbs. But Russia's special relationship with the Serbs prevented the Security Council from acting. So NATO did it anyway. And what that meant was, according to an international commission of jurists, was that it was illegal, unlawful, but legitimate because of the humanitarian motive. Unlawful, but legitimate. Curious. That's where we are today. We are basically being asked to consider unilateral, without Security Council authorization intervention, which makes it unlawful. Um, the reason we ought not go down that road without serious consideration 
is the way the, the Kosovo intervention was used by the Bush administration to invade Iraq. They used it as a justification. They pulled back and said, we acted without UN Security Council authorization in Kosovo because it was the right thing to do. We're going to do it here because it's the right thing to do. That was an abuse of a precedent, but the precedent was set. And people like me, who argued for an intervention in Kosovo, have to own our part in creating the rhetorical conditions that made the Iraq war likely or more possible. So that is all to say that, that we don't have good options here. We have unlawful options, unless, of course, we find ourselves the target of ISIS, and then that would create a self-defense response like in Afghanistan. Um, or we continue to play diplomatic you know, put diplomatic pressure on Russia. And Russia is actually, the this, this ceasefire that's going to go into place this weekend does seem to indicate that Russia is softening at least an iota. And it's been, and, and, and I, I suspect the reason that is, is it's starting to see that its own intervention into this conflict, unlawful as it is, right, is not going to pay the kind of dividends it had hoped for. Right? We intervene in this conflict at our peril. It may be the right thing to do to save the victims of, of war, but we intervene at our peril. It is going to be a mess if and when we get involved. It is, there is no easy military or perhaps even possible military solution to this conflict. It's a different landscape of conflict altogether. So I, I'm afraid I don't have much optimism about Syria. I really think this ends badly for everyone. Please. Oh, back over here. Yes. Uh, my name is Marina. Marina. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Srebrenica, and mm -hmm. uh, I apologize. No, no, that's fine. Right. <laughs> I lived in Croatia during the war in Croatia and in Bosnia, and uh, I remember Srebrenica yeah. very well. Uh, it's important, I think, to mention that that was a United Nations oh, thank safety you. zone. Yes. And those people were supposed to be protected. United Nations soldiers, Dutch soldiers were there. Um, but when Serbs attacked, they basically packed and they left those people yeah. over there to be slaughtered and die. So um, you are probably much more aware of uh, that and uh, uh, familiar with the fact that uh, women and mothers sue the Dutch government. Mm -hmm. Successfully. Successfully. And uh, um, my question is basically, how can we make sure, because there are people mentioning uh, those safety zones in Syria, why don't we keep people there? Why don't we make sure that they're safe uh, in their own country? How can we make sure that that Srebrenica is not going to get repeated? That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, it was called the UN Protection Force, UN Profor. What an extraordinary misnomer. They, they watched the Serbian forces march those 8,000 men and boys out into the woods and shoot them and bury them in mass graves under their watch. It was, supposed, it was a designated UN safe haven. I'm, I'm so grateful to you for bringing this up because it was, I, I meant to mention it in my brief uh, survey of the 90s. It was another one of those examples of the kind of schizophrenia of our engagement with atrocity reaction and prevention. We engaged finally, but you know, we were, I mean, there was a UN protective force there, but it didn't have a mandate or they didn't understand their mandate. Uh, to be serious enough to prevent that act of genocide. Uh, the Dutch government, the Dutch authorities has not, have, have, you know, have not bought that argument and have found them responsible for a dereliction of duty. So they see it actually differently. But I'm, I'm kind of willing to grant them some benefit of the doubt that the mandate was perhaps unclear. Right? Um, so um, one of the most important contributions to the R2P debate uh, has been um, offered by Brazil. Uh, in response to the Libya um, intervention, when it issued its report at the General Assembly, there's an annual General Assembly debate at the UN about R2P. And its contribution was known as responsibility while protecting. Because it is not just neglect 
Sometimes peacekeeping forces outright violate the human rights of the people they have been sent to protect. This was true in Somalia when a young Somali was was sodomized and beaten to death by Canadian peacekeepers for fun. Anytime you send soldiers trained to kill to do humanitarian work, you are setting up contradictions and dilemmas. You have to be willing to, to sort of recognize that. So one of the most important contributions to the discourse on R2P today is this responsibility while protecting, taking seriously the mandate as it is expressed by the Security Council to keep those who are sent on this mission responsible to the Security Council, to make sure they don't go beyond the mandate as they did in Libya, to make sure they carry out the mandate as specified by the, by the Security Council, to take seriously threats to the people under their care, to prevent them from being the very agent of harm that they have proven themselves to be again and again and again, including most recently in the Central African Republic, where French peacekeepers there to protect people from genocide were violating little boys sexually in exchange for food. Um, this is a very important contribution from Brazil. And, this, and it, was a, it was a slam, it was a critique of NATO's Ex, um, um, you know, abuse of the mandate, but it has turned out to be a lingering, very solid contribution to our understanding of the problems and prospects of, of, of meaningful humanitarian action. Um, so thank you for that question. That was really helpful. Um, please. Yeah. I'd like to go back to the R2P. Yeah. First pillar you had there was to pre uh, responsibility to prevent. And when you bring a force into a country to prevent, you now have that country, nationalism increases, mm -hmm. and you have resentment against the force to prevent. So now you have the problem of the responsibility to rebuild. You have nationalism that has risen against the force that has gone in to prevent, which makes it harder to do the rebuild. My thought is, and I'd like you to comment, that the pillars should be reversed, mm -hmm. and that we first must think of how to rebuild before we go in and think of how to prevent. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the um, ICUS report, the original report, said very clearly that prevention was the most important element of the three. But they spent five times as much paper discussing military intervention in reaction than it did in the prevention section of the report. Uh, they got it wrong in their own report. Um, if, you take them if you take them at their word, though, um, Prevention is about much, much more than an intervention. It's about diplomacy. It's about, I would like to think, what, the, um, what is known as structural prevention, you know, kind of economic development to create conditions more, more amenable to peace and security, right? kind of going after the root causes of conflicts that give rise to crimes associated with the RGP. So much of, in my view anyway, and I think, I think this is true of others who you know, like me, I, I, I fancy myself a sympathetic critic of R2P. I'm an, I'm an advocate for it, but I appreciate its weaknesses and its dangers, as we've seen in places like Libya. Um, but I take the prevention um, obligation seriously and think that it has much more to do with diplomacy and economic assistance and those kinds of things, and interventions well upstream from, from the actual explosion of events. Um, it may require, you know, if indicators are, one of the things we do now better is understand the way that mass atrocity crimes unfold. Um, and so we have early warning systems that are more effective that help us understand when these things are sort of coming up. And, and, um, uh, and so inter, uh, prevention can, can we're, we're enabled and empowered to act without military action to prevent. But it may also include military intervention if we miss those signs and it, and it does come up sort of more spontaneously. Um, so so um, I, think, um, your, I, th I think your conception of rebuilding as kind of going after the kind of social structural elements that give rise to conflict is exactly the right thing. Um, and it's why it's my critique of rebuilding in Cote d'Ivoire. It's all this kind of superficial stuff right? and not really going after the kind of root causes, um, the, you know, the, the youth unemployment rate in, in uh, Ivory Coast remains at over 40%. Um, you know, the, the, the gun problem, um, the victor's justice, you know, all of those kind of root causes remain unaddressed, but they've got 10% rates of economic growth. You know, that's, we call that this liberal peace, and, and it ain't. Right? Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's a reasonable engagement with your question, but I'm, I'm really sympathetic to, to your points. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. The, the kind of restructuring of society in ways that promote peace building. Absolutely. Um, we're, I, think, I think we're on the same team. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, please. Hi, my name's Peter. Hi, Peter. Um, I have my concerns about things overseas uh, starting to translate to our domestic mm. uh, arena. And um, we see uh, certain things that are similarities, militarization um, in certain areas mm -hmm. of the country. Uh, we see a increasing braggadocia over you know, being able to carry concealed weapons. Uh, here in Michigan right now, uh, there is a piece of legislation that may be headed towards the governor's desk soon to, cons to not have a license to conceal carry. Um, and, you know, we have media that, uh, you know, we've become a divided, I mean, I, I see shades of the, the kind of media that we're in Rwanda. Um, I do, I do too. I, it's, I've had this talk twice today. Okay. So, uh, and, you know, we see a, a very vitriolic uh, um, current uh, election uh, cycle occurring. Um, I was wondering if you could comment yeah. on these things. Thank you. Um, I, 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 twice, in two separate conversations, this idea about the climate in this electoral cycle is, resonates uh, with, with me as a student of, of genocide. As you kind of look through um, what the Sentinel Project calls the eight stages of genocide, you can start to recognize, um, and, and I talked about this on the radio today too, um, or on television. Um, I'll, I'll tell just a brief story. Um, I spent my final undergraduate year in, in the University of Montpellier in France, and one of the best friends I made was a young Rwandan named Anani Nkurunziza. And we had, a, you know, just a great year, you know, bit of wine as you do in France, and French cigarettes up too late, solving the world's problems, you know, we just, just, just loved each other, you know, it was a great, great relationship. And at the end of the year, we parted ways, and we, you know, tears in our eyes, and he gave me this great gift of a book from Rwanda, and and I saw it on my bookshelf about six or seven years ago, and I hadn't thought of Anani in a long time, and I realized I hadn't thought of him throughout that whole kind of exploration of Rwanda that I've been doing. And so I went lurking for his name to see if they were compiling lists of victims. Um, he, he survived. He, he was number three at radio, television, Mil Colin. He's a murderer. He's a mass murderer. My friend, this man who had tears in his eyes when we parted, was responsible for the genocide. Number three at Radio... And if you've ever seen like Hotel Rwanda, the radio was a principal agent of the genocide. And that was his ballywick. And I learned from that that if, if Anani Nkurunziza, this deeply compassionate man, is capable of mass murder, we must all be. And then I started to realize that, you know, that's in fact the case. It's happened in all, all parts of the globe in all times. It's biblical, it's contemporary. It's North America, Latin America, the heart of Europe, Africa, Asia, you name it. It's a part of the human condition. And why I am worried, is exa and exactly the terms you've expressed here today, is some of the language of, of irresponsible candidates for office resonates with students of genocide. It is about creating rhetorical conditions in which people can start to imagine a level of othering, a level of polarization, a level of dehumanization, which is absolutely essential for genocide to happen. To happen. Right? They are starting to create a fear, and one of the central principal conditions necessary for genocide is a fear, an existential fear for one's own community. And that's what you're starting to see discussed, is the threat that immigrants, and Arab Muslim immigrants in particular, pose to the survival of the American people. That's the existential threat that the Tutsis articulated. That's the existential threat that the Nazis articulated with its Dokstas myth, stabbed in the bathroom, all that kind of stuff. Right? So I totally agree with you that there is a certain level of irresponsibility in the language in this electoral cycle that just frightens. It's just beyond, I never saw it coming. I, you know, I, I would, on the one hand, say we've all got it. It's all possible. It could happen here. But I couldn't really envision the kind of rhetoric that I'm hearing today. It's wildly irresponsible. I think the militarization of American society is very similar to what I saw in Cote d'Ivoire. And the last thing I'd say is I, I organized an international symposium on R2P back in 2009 at DePaul University. And I brought people from all over the world, including one of my favorite scholars from Australia, Ann Orford, a, just a marvelous thinker and, a, and a, turns out to be a very funny person. 
And uh, she came up to her, you know, give her remarks. And she noted that there was a shooting range right across from the Ethics Institute where we're holding this symposium for the Sheriff's Department. And so when we're in here talking about humanitarian action, there's like these right, you know, automatic rifle fire going off in the background. Right? And then she noted how frequently she heard ambulances and police cars going, sirens going off in our little town of Greencastle, Indiana. And she kind of half-jokingly said, you know, we might need to start talking about a humanitarian intervention in the Greencastle, Indiana, because there's some stuff going on out here that's pretty scary, right? And she was absolutely, and people were like, that's just a little too close to home. That, that was just too accurate to be funny, you know? And, and um, so I, um, I don't know if I'm engaging in a way that you'd hope for, but I'm, I'm, um, I think I'm with you on that. Um, there's some real concerning developments that... Uh, you know, this kind of frightening populism that we're seeing. We have time for one last question. Oh, good. Oh, um, hello. Hi. So this past What's weekend, it? my name is Ashley. I'm one Ashley. of Durham students. Oh, yeah, yeah Ashley. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this past weekend, Aquinas College had the privilege to represent Libya and Model Arab League. Oh. And one of the issues that we had to come across was navigating through the um, political vacuum that you were describing oh, there. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of curious, like, what would you suggest or what would you see that needs to be done to help Libya build a stable and functioning government? That's a great question. I, I, and again, I wish I had some optimism here. Um, one of the legacies of Muammar Gaddafi, I'm not, you know, I, I can critique our intervention, but that's not the same thing as saying I was a defender of Muammar Gaddafi. He was, he was a disaster for Libya in, in many ways, not in every respect, but in most respects. One of the things he did was not allow a meaningful set of state institutions to build, to, to emerge in Libya, because they would pose potential threats to his rule. So he gutted the military, he gutted the institutions that would have been rule of law structures, he gutted the educational system. He, he just, you know, the state was just this very weak set of, you know, flexible, floppy kind of institutions. Um, when he was gone, it just all collapsed like, you know, flying in the cupboard, as Eddie Izzard would say. Um, so what's required is state building. It's, un, it's uninteresting, it's not sexy, it, you know, it's not military, it's, you know, but it's the work that has to be done. It's about building, you know, governing institutions that deliver services to people who need them. Right? From police to education to public health to you name it, agricultural. And it's hard for many Americans to appreciate the centrality of this project because in this country, the rhetoric is increasingly that the government is our enemy, that building state institutions up is a threat to our liberty. And, you know, that's true at some extreme level of stateness, right? But we've seen what it's like to live in conditions of state weakness and collapse. The Taliban's come in, the Al-Qaeda's come in. I mean, they set up shop because states not strong enough to govern their borders aren't strong enough to put down rebellions and those kinds of things. So terrible things happen in conditions of chronic state weakness and failure and collapse. Right? So Libya is now a condition of collapse, but it was you know, always on the brink of collapse, we now realize, because there was just nothing to the state itself. Right? So I think the answer to your question is, is clear, but daunting. It's about state building. It's about the slow, deliberate process of building institutions of governance that will deliver the services that people expect of their state. And putting the money in there and, and doing the advising and doing the development assistance work and helping Libya build a state. But that right, presumes, well, there's, a, there's something called the security development nexus. And it's this hard nut to crack idea, right? The idea is that development is required if we're going to enjoy peace and security. We have to have an adequate level of economic and political development if we're gonna enjoy peace and security. But we can't expect to obtain that level, of, that requisite level of economic and political development in the absence of peace and security. In other words, the conditions of insecurity prevent the development needed to bring that insecurity to an end. Right? How do you fix that? How do you, that's a conundrum. Right? 
So the solution seems to be, the way to crack that nut, the way to get out of that conundrum is to do the slow, unattractive, unsexy development assistance work to help build states. If you think about you know, how much we expect, we may be anti-government Americans in some fundamental sense, right? but even we have a very long list of expectations of the state. We want the planes to stay in the air, we want our radio communications to work, we want our roads to be passable, we want the food we buy to not kill us. We have a very long list of expectations of even a limited state in the United States. That's where they have to get, is some even minimalist functioning state. But they have to figure out how to do that in the context now of remarkable, remarkable, devastating insecurity. It is a anarchical condition if there ever was one. Muammar Gaddafi, like Saddam Hussein, was bad for Iraq, but the vacuum that followed their removal in both cases may have been worse, quite clearly been worse. Does that answer your question? Great question. Thank you. Thank you. One of our goals at the World Affairs Council of West Michigan uh, is to foster a globally enlightened community and citizenry. And uh, certainly tonight, Dr. O'Bannon, you have enlightened us significantly, and we're very grateful for that. I also thought of an ancient Near Eastern proverb that says that knowledge hurts. And a lot of what you shared tonight with us that has enlightened us uh, hurts a great deal. Uh, we talk to our students about identifying and challenging our own assumptions, and certainly you have helped us tonight to do that. And you've sent us away this evening not only with answers, uh, but also with some questions, as a good educator would do. So thank you for that, a great gift.